Hello, Night Nation. This is Andrew Fagley, and you're listening to Nightline Extra only on the Nightline Sports Network. All right, yep, that's right. I'm Andrew Fagley, and this is Nightline Extra from the award-winning Nightline Sports Network. Nightline, the winners of Florida BlogCon's favorite podcast of the year at their eighth annual awards. Thank you very much for that. Again, I will keep saying that. When we last saw the Knights, they moved to 8-0, beating Temple 52-40, UCF's 21st straight win. As for the polls, the hell with them. UCF wins and falls to number 11 in the coaches and AP polls. The only one that really matters is the college football playoff poll, and UCF stayed at 12. This week, the Knights are back home for a Saturday high noon matchup with Navy, wrapping up homecoming week. In this extra, you will hear from a Navy insider. Trace Trelko hops on the AAC's conference call to talk with Navy's head coach, and former UCF quarterback Kyle Israel goes inside the huddle. Here we go. Five questions with an insider. Getting to know this week's opponent. Time to learn more about the 2-7 and seven Navy. Let's turn to Bill Wagner, who covers the midshipmen for the Capital Gazette Communications. Bill joins us on the Nightline Hotline. Bill, how are you doing? Doing great. Looking forward to coming down to Orlando. I hope we're going to have good weather on Saturday. It should be, I believe. Uh, Navy's struggling, losers of six straight, uh, including last weekend's 42-0 loss at Cincinnati. What's going on with Navy? You know, it's just been a dismal season all around, and it's kind of hard to put your finger on what has happened. Uh, the Navy has been such a consistent program, posted winning seasons in 14 of the last 15 years. Obviously, last year ended on a down note, may have been a harbinger, of what we're seeing this year, uh, Navy lost six of their last seven games after starting 5-0, and finished 500, ended up uh, winning the Military Bowl, which was a big lift going into the offseason. But things have really fallen apart, and it, there's a lot of issues. You could go through the, the, you know, the offense just is not the same as it has been. The standard that they have set for years with this triple option just is not there this year. Quarterback issues, they just don't have a – top flight quarterback to run this offense and then the defense has been just really terrible to be frank uh, there's they, they haven't stopped anyone they're bitten you know shredded by every opponent and last last weekend at cincinnati was rock bottom to be honest if they did not compete the way that i'm accustomed to seeing navy compete on the field and it was a total debacle yeah. Well, the midshipmen rushed for only uh, 124 yards against the Bearcats. Tell us about the O-line and the running backs. Well, I mean, I keep talking. In fact, I just interviewed the offensive line coach, Ashley Ingram, and he tries to keep telling me that they're practicing well and it's, you know, little things here and there. And I, I don't – obviously the offensive line is not getting the job done. They would be rushing for far more yards than they are if this offensive line was doing its job. And so uh, some of this is defense. They're playing some good defenses. And, uh, let's you know, uh, defenses are getting, in the American Athletic Conference, they're getting more accustomed to the option. It's not as foreign to them as it used to be. Defensive coordinators are getting a better feel for how to stop it. Um, and in terms of ball carriers, the Navy offense has always been reliant on an outstanding quarterback, first and foremost. He's got the ball in his hands, every play, making decisions, running quite a bit, and they have not had production from the quarterback position. Malcolm Perry started the season. He's really not a quarterback. He's a running back in Navy's offense. That translates to being a slot back. Uh, but he, he, you know, he had some long breakaway runs, but he was not running the offense the way that it needs to be run. So they moved him back to slot back, which is his more natural position. They tried Garrett Lewis. You know, he, he does some good things. He's a good passer, but he also is not an, a real dynamic runner. And now it looks like they're back to Zach Abey, who last year through five games was outstanding, rushing for over 100 yards in every game, almost 200 in a few, a uh, real inside running threat. And I think that's what Navy is hoping to recapture at this point. Is it, if with everything else not working, let's at least go back to what worked at the beginning of last year, which was Zach Abey running between the tackles. 
Well, that was going to be my next question, actually. My next question was, what can we expect from the quarterback position? Zach Aby was just three of four for 75 yards last week. I know that the throwing game is not a big deal for Navy, but you got to do it every once in a while, I guess. Really, that is the problem for Navy. They, you know, it's the old saying, if, if you have two quarterbacks, you have none. Well, guess what? Navy's had three, and that tells you something, that there's issues with each one of them. Malcolm Perry is the most dynamic runner Navy has. He's the fastest player on the team. He's a breakaway threat, but he's 170 pounds. Then the option in an option offense, the quarterback takes a lot of hits. He gets hit if he carries the ball. He gets hit when he doesn't carry the ball because he's got to execute fakes and he's going to get hit. So, you know, Malcolm Perry is not an option quarterback. He's not built for it. So, that, you know, he had his weaknesses. Garrett Lewis is a very good passer. He's the best passer Navy has, but he's not a dynamic runner. He's not a power runner, nor is he a perimeter speed type guy. Uh, so now Zach A.B. is back there. He's a power runner in between the tackles, but he's not a real perimeter threat. He's not very fast. So, you know, it makes you realize how incredible it was to have Keenan Reynolds a guy that could do it all. He could uh, put his pads down and run with some power inside. He had the speed and quickness and moves to get you yardage on the perimeter, and he could throw the ball. He was the complete package, and Navy is missing that at the quarterback position. And the party line right now is that it could be Garrett Lewis, it could be Zach Aby. Uh, with the way this season has gone, who knows? But uh, I have a feeling that they're going to give Zach Aby one more shot because he started the last game. And, you know, what happened against Cincinnati was not Zach Aby's fault by any stretch of the imagination. So I, I have a sense that they're going to give Zach Aby one more shot. Let's move over to the other side of the ball a little bit. Cincinnati rushed for 262 yards. Now Navy plays in Orlando against UCF's potent rushing attack, not to mention quarterback Mackenzie Milton and crew. Uh, could be a long day for the midshipmen. Yeah, I mean, Navy has shown no ability to stop anyone. Uh, you, you know, did, it doesn't matter what type of offense. They played a variety of offenses. You know, you got Houston and Memphis are tend to be more spread teams. Uh, Temple was more of a power running attack, RPO stuff. Notre Dame was more pro style and mixed the run and pass. It doesn't matter. They have not stopped anyone. They, they don't stop the run. They're not good in pass defense. You know, they play a loose zone pass defense. They get shredded that way. They try to, tighten up and maybe play a little more man-to-man, get after the quarterback. They don't get any pressure on the quarterback, so they get picked apart in man-to-man coverage. Um, There's just nothing working for the Navy defense. And, uh, you know, I have no uh, hope that they're going to have any more success against Central Florida. Really, on paper, Central Florida's the best offense the Navy will have faced to date. They just lost to Cincinnati 42 to nothing. They uh, lost to uh, Notre Dame 42. They gave up 42 points to Notre Dame. I mean, this this defense is in disarray, and I don't know what they can do to suddenly turn around. In fact, I was asking defensive coordinator Dale Pearson, maybe it's time to just start doing something crazy. I mean, blitzing every down, sending six men. I mean, who knows? Maybe <laughs> do something so out of the box. That, that it throws a team like Central Florida for a loop. I don't know. Yeah, right. Well, the ne- <laughs> my next question you're really not going to like then. Uh, I was going to say, how do you see this one playing out? Any chance for an upset? Well, it all starts with Navy's offense, really. And to be fair, we should say that Navy's lack of success on offense, they've had more three and outs this year than they've had in the previous four years combined. So they're putting that defense back on the field very quickly tired and and so part of what's happened to the defense is the fault of the offense so with navy it starts with the offense they must control the clock eat you know long extended drives 10 plays 75 yards 11 plays 68 yards eat taking five minutes off the clock that's the navy formula for success then the defense isn't on the field so much and when you're not on the field so much and also the the other side of the coin is that if the offense, like the Central Florida, isn't on the field as often as they're accustomed to, if they're standing on the sideline 
for lengthy periods of the time while the Navy offense is driving the field, they might be a little anxious and try to hurry up and get something done. So for Navy, it has always started with the offense. And when the offense is not getting the job done, not producing points, it puts a strain all around. And so if, if there's any hope of Navy pulling an upset, their offense has to play at the highest level it has played all season. They got to dominate possession. They got to put points on the board, keep Central Florida off the field offensively. That's the only hope Navy has. Really looking forward to it. We're excited to have Navy coming to, to Orlando for the first time to play the Knights. I, for one, am a huge military supporter, so I'm really looking forward to it. I hope that it's a good game, you know, a competitive game for everybody. Blowouts aren't any fun, to be honest with you. So I hope it all turns out good and everybody stays healthy and, uh, and Navy enjoys their time in Orlando. Right. Well, Navy's got to get things turned around. I mean, it's been a, you know, six straight losses. If they lose this game Saturday, it'll be their longest losing streak since 2002, and they went 2-10 and ten that year. So uh, Navy has not had any kind of season like this in a long time. And uh, so they are really desperate to do something to turn things around. Where can people read your work and follow you on social media? www.capitalgazette.com is our website. And there's links to my Twitter feed there. And, uh, you know, I'm always tweeting during the game updates as to what's happening, injury reports and all that. So if you're looking to get any kind of Navy perspective from this game on Saturday, you know, follow me on Twitter. You can find me through the CapitalGazette.com website. All righty. Thank you very much, Bill. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. All right, guys. Have you seen our new website? It is www.nightlinesports.com. It is absolutely beautiful. We are very, very proud of it. If you haven't seen it yet, please check it out. www.nightlinesports.com. There's all kinds of stuff on there. It is beautiful, and there are T-shirts that you can buy. T-shirts are $15. They're either a black T-shirt with either a white Nightline logo on it or a black T-shirt with the gold Nightline logo on it, or there's another one that says uh, Go Knights Charge On with the Nightline head right in the middle of it. Please go check that out. We would really appreciate it. And uh, T-shirts are going fast, so get your orders in now for Christmas. We hear from Navy head coach Ken Niatamalolo, and we're talking with former Knight Kyle Israel when Nightline Extra continues in just a moment. Hey, this is Travis Dever, Kai's Real Estate, the Dever team, New Smyrna Beach, your source for real estate and everything else, New Smyrna Beach, proud sponsor of Nightline and Nightline Post Game Live. Call me anytime at 386-690-1636. That's 386-690-1636. Let me show you my hometown, New Smyrna Beach, UCF's favorite beach. Go Knights and charge on. This segment is brought to you by Scouted, the app where athletes of all ages get exposed, discovered, and recruited. Download for free on the Apple Store or Google Play and get discovered today. Next up, Trace Trelko was on the AAC Coaches Conference call and asked Navy's head coach, Ken Niatamalolo, about each team's rushing attack. Well, you know, licking our wounds right now, we've got to be pretty good by a good Cincinnati team. It's you know, We've never been beat like that, and got to give coach you know, and their staff credit and the players credit. We got outcoached, you know, outplayed, and um, like I said, you know, I can't remember getting beat like that before, but... Uh, we got to bounce back against, you know, uh, you know the best team in our conference, you know, undefeated. Uh, it's going to be a, another tall order for us. And we're just, you know, trying to work as hard as we can to make sure that we get ready. But it's going to be a tall, tall order. Obviously, you know, um, McKenzie is, you know, one of the best quarterbacks in the country. They're, you know, pretty much unstoppable on offense. They're playing really well, obviously undefeated. Longest winning streak in the country. You know, ranked you know 12 or actually higher than that. 11. You know, I mean they're ranked pretty high, and you know it's. Uh, but they've been winning a lot of games the last two years in our league, and nobody's been able to beat them. And coach, you know, Josh is doing a really good job there too. Just kind of picked up, you know, where Scott left, and they've. It's 
impressive that they've kind of moved on. Uh, you know, new coaching staff, but the, the players have adjusted to the new culture and they continue to win. So it's super impressed with them. And you know, we we haven't been playing well this year, and we got to find a way to play well. And you know, again, against especially a really good football team coming up in Central Florida. Take our first question from Trace Trico from the Nightline Sports uh, Network. Uh, hello, Coach. Uh, why was Cincinnati so successful in bottling up your run game? Uh, I just thought they played hard. You know, I mean, their kids executed. Uh, you know, we just, you know, we just had uh, too many mistakes at different spots. It wasn't, you know, the whole play or whatever. It might be a, a player here or there, and we just didn't execute well enough against a good team like that. But you know. They were, they were well prepared, and their kids played hard. On the flip side, UCF's rushing attack pretty dominant uh, against Temple. What do you see in the film that gives you thought that you can uh, you can get that uh, rushing attack? <laughs> uh, we're still looking at it. <laughs> we haven't figured. It. Did you say how do we stop that rushing attack? Dent it. I mean, we're, uh, we haven't found any dents yet. I don't. So we're we're still <laughs> we're still looking for a way to do that. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, Trace. Hey, Night Nation. It's Adam from the Sons of UCF. Be sure to check out our show every Wednesday only on the Nightline Sports Network. Now, back to two guys who probably won't be Cow of the Week nominees, Andrew and Trace. All right, getting you ready for UCF's game against Navy. We'll check with former UCF quarterback Kyle Israel in just a minute. You know, ever since I started Nightline, people have been asking me for advice. Usually, it's what team to bet on this week. The truth is, I don't know who's going to win, but if you think that you know, you got to check out my bookie. Remember, who you're betting on is just as important as who you're betting with. That's why I always tell people to bet with my bookie. Trust me, guys, they're the best bet this season. They've been in business for years, they have great reviews online, and their mobile site is easy to use. Lay down some cash and win big today. They have in-game live betting, the most rewarding player perks in the business, and for you fantasy guys out there, you can even bet over under on how many fantasy points a player is going to score each game. Join now and MyBookie will match your deposit dollar for dollar. Use promo code NIGHT to activate the offer. You play, you win, you get paid. Visit MyBookie online today. Welcome to Inside the Huddle with former UCF quarterback Kyle Israel, brought to you by the Little Greek Fresh Grill. Fresh, flavorful, fabulous water for lakes, 855 North Althea Trail, Orlando. Hey, Kyle, welcome back. We haven't talked to you in a long time. It seems like forever. Yeah, it does. I mean, I, I think it's been certainly since maybe the ECU game um, when McKenzie was out in that game that it's that we've chatted, but I'm glad to get back on with you this evening. Absolutely. So what are your thoughts on uh, the Temple UCF game? It was quite the, the offensive showing. Yeah, it looks like uh, it looked a lot like a Big 12 game, uh, <laughs> to be honest with you. That's exactly what it looked like defensively. Um, but you know, obviously we struggled defensively in the first half. Um, you know, I, I think when you look at Temple, Anthony Russo, they lost to Villanova. Anthony Russo was a starting quarterback. Uh, and then all of a sudden uh, they kind of uh, figured out, wow, this guy can play. And I'll tell you what, our defense struggled. There's no doubt about that. But I do want to give Temple some credit because their offense, they have a great running back in Armstead, who almost rushed for 150. And then Anthony Russo, I think at 6'4", 229, as a sophomore is a guy that's going to give us a lot of problems in the next two seasons uh, with Temple. He's a talented quarterback. I was very impressed to be honest with you. Um, And I think, you know, our defense being out of position um, and and really not in, in my mind, well prepared for Temple's offense in that first half, uh, he was good enough to take advantage of it. So, um, it was obvious the defensive struggles we had early on, but then again, like Randy Shannon's been doing all season, our defense has gone in at halftime and made adjustments, and we only give up six points, uh, and that's not really until 
um, you know, the fourth quarter of the second half. So obviously offensively, I don't think it was our best game, but we were able to put up 52 points. We averaged two touchdowns a quarter and uh, you saw some, some rustiness from McKenzie. Uh, I think he missed some throws that he would like to have back. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, you always kind of have confidence in this feeling when you're watching our team that this isn't a George O'Leary coach team where being down 10 or 13 or 17 points is, um, is going to put you out of the ball game. With our offense, we can score in a minute, two minutes, three minutes, and you always feel like you're, you're right there uh, in each game. And we've been able to, uh, to kind of fulfill those thoughts that fans may have throughout the course of the games with our offense. But uh, again, you know, I think that we need to prepare defensively better for teams during the week but we're certainly making great adjustments defensively at halftime. Right. Yeah, I want to talk to you a little bit about that defense. Do you think that they're not prepared during the week like you just mentioned, or for some reason they can make these incredible changes at halftime? They are a complete second-half team as far as uh, the the defense goes, and and it's night and day between the first half and the second half. Does that have anything to do with Randy Shannon being up in the box? Does it have anything to do with them being on the field all the time? What's the problem with the defense? What I'm going to tell you right here is going to be somewhat speculation, all right, because it's hard to really nail down anything. However, um, you know, I'm not saying that our Randy and his staff aren't preparing, but, you know, I put it back on the players too. I mean, I'm looking at some defensive backs that are shying away from contact, um, that are uh, whiffing on tackles, and and I'm looking, and I love Pat Jasinski, but versus Armstead and with uh, strong running backs and running backs that can get to the edge with speed, Pat, um, it just isn't isn't scraping down the line and making the plays that we've seen him make in years, and really in the last uh, this season and last. And I don't know if he's banged up. He is. Um, he, he's definitely he banged, banged, up. banged up. Yeah, he's definitely he's, banged up. There's no doubt about it. And obviously you want a leader like that on the, uh, you know, a guy that experienced on our defense, you want him on the field, but at some, at some point, you know, our middle linebacker in these stand up four three is so crucial uh, to stop the run when teams are only allowing us to keep five or six guys in the box. And Pat being banged up, I think is a big issue for us defensively at the linebacker position. You saw in the second half, he was rotating in and out of the game more and we we're able to get, um, you know, some better play uh, from other guys. But, you know, I, I, I've, our defensive backs had made plays, but I, I feel like they're a bit soft physically, to be honest, if I'm going to be critical of them. Uh, I think like I think that they need, um, you know, to be a little bit more aggressive. However, you know, I, when you look at Randy Shannon and his coaching experience, not only being a head coach, but as a defensive coordinator, one thing that I would expect in hiring a guy like him is somebody that is capable of making in-game adjustments. And he's seen everything. He's prepared for everything. And, uh, you know, Temple could have showed up with, you know, 12, 15 different plays that they weren't anticipating in the first half or have broken some of the tendencies that maybe we saw them have throughout the course of the season, which is what you're naturally going to see about halfway through. Teams will start to self-evaluate, figure out what teams are looking at regards to their own uh, tendencies, and then try to make adjustments. And, And a lot of times when you're at that halfway point or just into the second half of the season, um, offenses will all of a sudden start to start to click a little bit more. And many times it's because they've broken their own tendencies and, and that gave them an advantage for two quarters. Um, but Randy was able to make adjustments. Our defense stepped up and our offense was able to keep the foot on the pedal. And, and that forced Temple to start getting out of what they are comfortable doing, um, which ultimately led to us kind of pulling away there towards the end. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's amazing the the changes that they make at halftime. I mean, I, I wish that they somehow could go into a game like that instead of having to do that at halftime. Uh, maybe this week will be a little bit different with that. We'll have to see. There's two guys I want to talk to you about, uh, though, from last week. Number one, Greg McRae. Uh, mm-hmm. What an incredible job that that kid did. 188 yards on 16 carries. He is... Uh... He has been kind of the dark horse for us all season. Obviously, 
Otis and Adrian coming into the year, as everybody certainly who listens to your podcast knows, um, were going to be the bell horses for us. But everybody that I had talked to in the off season in the summer, especially after spring, had said, don't sleep on Greg McRae. And he kind of looks a little bit funny. He's a little bit slender and taller of a back, um, you know, and, and doesn't look to be physically overwhelming. But I'll tell you what, he's got incredible vision. He's very slippery. He's able to make cuts and still re- keep his speed. Excuse me. Um, you know, he's making a guy miss while while and doing it at full speed. Right. And guys that can do that are very, very dangerous. And um, and then he's got enough size on him to be powerful, to lower his pads, to make uh, safeties pay in the secondary. Uh, and then if he can get loose, he'll he'll, he'll turn a corner, break an angle, and, and and run for a long touchdown. So I think that Greg McCray is more of of that uh, north and south back um, that that I think Coach Hype will really thinks is a great complement to this uh, play action and down the field passing game. And I think he's somebody that as the season goes on, we're going to have to continue to to utilize and and maybe even more than we have thus far. I mean, you still question okay where does that leave adrian and where does that leave otis um and even taj but at the same time you got to give the ball to the guy with a hot hand and right now that's seemingly greg mccray yeah you know i started looking at the record books a little bit because i didn't remember the last time we had a, a a rushing game like that and it's been quite a bit i think that that 188 would rank like in the top 10 rushing games in UCF history. Um, wow. If you gave Greg McRae the amount of rushes, I mean, in, on 16 carries getting 188 yards, imagine if this kid could get 20 or 25. Those are huge numbers that that guy would put up. Yeah, No doubt. So There's no doubt about that. And he, yeah, I mean, if he's, if he's going to put up those numbers and, you know, we got to find more ways to get him the football and it feels like it has to be some level of a balancing uh, uh, act because you, you want to keep these other guys happy. But, you know, I don't know what – I'm kind of scratching my head with Otis this season. I was very high on him going in. Um, you, you know, I don't think that his talent has diminished. You saw what he can do some at wide receiver uh, when Gabe Davis was went down with injury early on in the game. Uh, you know, made, He made two pretty good catches down the field. Um but, you, you know, you also want guys that, that really work inside this offense. And right now, Greg McRae is, is a guy that we can count on. Yeah. Well, Otis Anderson this last game had two carries for 12 yards, yeah. obviously an average of six. Um, and then Killens had nine carries for 35 yards, an average of 3.8. There's a big difference between an average of 11.8, I guess, for 16 carries. That's crazy. Uh, I think that they found something from him. I wish that it wouldn't have taken so long for them to to get him out there and to find that. This week will be a perfect week for him. You spoke earlier a little bit about McKenzie and showing a little bit of rust. First of all, let's go back to that ECU game when he didn't play. What did you think of, of the job that that Daryl Mack did then, uh, as you know, coming in as the backup for the very first time, and then talk about McKenzie uh, coming back and playing this week? Well, I think it's always difficult for the backup quarterback, certainly getting the first start in their career. I can remember what that was like in two thousand and four, and it's a bit overwhelming. I think that our offense now is geared toward helping the quarterback be more successful, certainly more at a younger age because uh, the concepts and reads are a little bit more um, uh, or a little easier to understand and to see on the field. And, and, you know, he had, he has an advantage. He's athletic and he was able to use his athleticism um, to help us win that football game. I think he made some throws when we needed him to, uh, you know, he did miss some throws, and, and there certainly needs to be a lot of uh, improvement uh, for when McKenzie moves on if, if, if Dariel wants to, you know, be the starting quarterback at UCF. But we asked him to come in and in a game on the road. ECU is not an a easy place to play. I understand this isn't the best team that they've had. Um, but I think, you know, if, if you're the backup, you want to go in and find a way to win the football game. And that's what you want out of it. You don't care about stats. You don't care about your 80-yard touchdown run. You know, all those things uh, when you're at that point in your career don't matter as much as just knowing that the team got a victory when you started a football game. And so 
it was a great confidence booster and builder for him. Um, you know, if we have to go to him later in this season, if McKenzie goes down, which we know he is banged up, then then he has an entire game. Does Mac? uh you know underneath him and it was a road game so he's played in in a hostile environment so i think it was all in all great for him great for the program to know that we have a guy uh or at least an offense where you can plug somebody in and and still be productive um and it was good timing because uh as many people know mckenzie has been very banged up that ankle his shoulder uh throughout the course of the season and and trust me coach hype wasn't going to sit him unless he absolutely thought he needed it so what did you think about his return in this game? You said that you thought that he looked a little bit rusty, which he did, obviously. Mm-hmm. Yes, and, and, and when you, you know, there's, there's reports that McKenzie hasn't been able to practice much now since before the pit game even. Um, and so when you are not out there uh, every day uh, staying in sync with your wide receivers and throwing the ball down the field and just, and just doing things that, that most people would need to do to go out uh, on a game day and, and perform. Um, it, it even magnifies uh, what McKenzie is able to do, in my opinion, to have little to no practice for a number of weeks and still go out on Saturdays uh, for the past two weeks and, and get a victory um, is huge. And yeah, he is rusty. He's missing guys open down the field. Uh, Trey Nixon, two plays in a row. Certainly that McKenzie would have easily completed the first one last year, would have been touchdown, and we would have been off the field. Um, and and he missed those throws. So I, I'm confident that as he continues to get healthy, um, he'll get more comfortable. But I, I'll tell you what, it's hard to be a quarterback with a banged-up shoulder, whether it's your throwing shoulder or your non-throwing shoulder, um, because you, you, start to, you start to think about that to some extent while you're playing, and it can affect – um, your ability to do things that you normally do, which is, you know, McKenzie got out and ran the ball and scored a touchdown on Saturday, but uh, you didn't see him taking as many hits. And, um, you know, the, we've known that he's he's not the biggest guy in the world. And so Coach Heupel, I think, has done a phenomenal job, phenomenal job of managing, you know, McKenzie being banged up. And, uh, you know, I'm confident in McKenzie. I haven't lost any confidence whatsoever. Um but when you're facing injury and those sort of things, it's just hard to perform at a level that we certainly saw him perform at uh, last year. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. All right, what do you know about Navy? That's our next opponent coming up. I know that their defense is not good this year. Their defense is not good. I think this is going to be a big, big day for our offense. Um, and, you know, a lot of fans are probably looking at Navy's record and saying, oh, they're not good this season. They're not the Navy of years past. And that's true. Um, but they did beat Memphis. Okay. They beat Memphis by one point. Um, and we know how good Memphis can be. They, they barely lost to SMU by one point who just beat Houston and they put up 36 points, uh, on Houston when they played them. And Houston has arguably the best defensive lineman in the country. Um, so I don't think the Navy has been able to, you know, piece game, you know, put a full game together. They don't have that defense to keep them in ball games like they have in years past. But I'll tell you what, you know, anytime you're playing a service academy, these are, these are the most elite individuals that we, our country has to offer. And they're going to come to play. And they're going to know it's our homecoming. Uh, they are Navy. People respect them anywhere they go. And, again, it's not the Navy of years past, but it's always a very well-coached football team. They're many years outmanned physically. This year that's been highlighted more than ever on the defensive side of the football. But they have a quarterback that's run this offense and A.B. that we've seen last year. And, uh, you know, I think that we're catching them at a good time after a, a serious beatdown last weekend that they took by, by Cincinnati, 42 to nothing. Uh, but I'll never, ever, Andrew, feel comfortable going into a game against Navy just because of who they are. Yeah, you always worry. They got destroyed last week, so they've got to still be feeling that and want to make up for that. You can never overlook a team like that at all. So The one the one thing I will note and that shouldn't be lost here is two weeks ago, you know, Navy played Notre Dame and lost 44 to 22. Um, but we will not be the best team, quote unquote, uh, according to the college football playoff committee. Um, oh boy. <laughs> we won't get into that right now. Um, we won't be the best team that they've played. We won't be the biggest team that they've played this season. I mean, these guys have, have played really good opponents uh, throughout the course of the year. 
uh, especially when you sprinkle in uh, Notre Dame and the fact that they've played a Cincinnati team that is also obviously ranked and very good. You know, they're coming in here and, and they're not going to be wide eyed and looking around and shocked by what they see on the field. Now, I hope we 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 do that to them. Um, but at the same time, this team is going to come ready to play. Absolutely. So who would you like to see step up and make a statement this week offensively? Offensively, um, I'd like to see Trey Nixon have a real big time breakout game. I really would. Um, I don't. I don't know if he's 100 percent healthy, um, but the way that you know he's he's had some big play opportunities. He's been overthrown a couple of times. We've seen his ability, um, but I would you know Gabe Davis has hit, had his breakout game, and Dredrick Snelson has had some big games. I would really love to see Trey Nixon you know, with two touchdowns and 140 yards receiving or something like that uh, this week, definitely. Okay. What about on the defensive side of the ball? Well, I'm going to put it on the front seven and the strong safety, Andrew. I mean, I, it's hard for me to highlight one guy because to stop a Navy attack, you need everybody to be on the same page. Your corner's got to know, uh, you know, when they are they're containing the outside gap. Safety's got to know when to fill, but also be careful of Navy's ability to run the play action and throw the ball deep. And your defensive line has to say gap sound, control their eyes, um, and linebackers have to scrape, fill, and make plays at the line of scrimmage. And you're going to have Pat Jasinski and our middle linebackers are going to have a fullback every single play of the day coming downhill, smashing them in their chin. And this is one of those games that I don't care if Navy's good or not. They are going to make you play physical, and we're going to need to be able to be gap sound, and we're going to have to have a very good game plan um, to stop these guys. So for me, it's the front seven and the strong safety. If that unit does not play well, that, that, the, that core group of eight guys, it will be a very long Saturday for us, or it certainly won't be high scoring because Navy's going to possess the ball like they're planning on doing as much of the game as possible. And so, uh, you know, for me, it's the, it's those eight guys have got to have their best game of the season um, or we're going to see some plays where you're going, how the heck did that fullback run 50 yards down the field for a touchdown? Yeah, well, they can definitely sneak the uh, the pass in on you as well when you're working on run, run, run. And then all of a sudden they throw one yep. last week. Zach Aby was three of four for 75 yards. What are the keys to the game on the offensive side of the ball to win against Navy this week? Well, I, for me, it's number one, you can't turn the ball over because every time you turn the ball over, you're losing valuable minutes that Navy's going to naturally chew up. Um, and uh, they're going to uh, want to play a possession game. But one, Navy wants to get this game in the fourth quarter, Andrew. How do we get UCF into the fourth quarter? where it's either tie, we're ahead, or sh within striking distance. That's a mindset for them. Um, so we need to get started fast. I think our, our pace of kind of for, you know getting into halftime with 28 points, I think we need to somehow find a way to do that, get a comfortable lead, um, and, and, and honestly keep McKenzie healthy. I, we have some very big games coming up. We have some talented opponents. I know South Florida lost to Tulane, but Tulane's better than people think. Um, and so this month of November and McKenzie's health is going to be extremely crucial to our outlook for a conference championship game here at Spectrum Stadium, being able to compete at a high level in that conference championship game and getting to a point where now McKenzie can get a month off uh, to rest before a big time bowl game. So, I, you know, get out fast, keep McKenzie from out of the running game. Uh, let's use Greg McCray more and you can't turn the ball over to Navy, or all of a sudden you're going to be in a football game that they want to play and, and you don't. All righty. So what about on the defensive side, key to the game? Defensive side of the ball is you got to be good on first down. You have got to hold Navy to minimal yards on first down because they get fourth and one, they get fourth and two, anywhere from their own 40-yard line and in, they're going to go for it on fourth down. They get into third and two second and four all day long, they're going to be hard to stop. So first down is the key for us on defense. That'll tell you how the game's going early on. Can we tackle them? Can we hold them to a one or two yard gain and get them to second and eight and then third and five or third and four? Because that is 
uh, that is when you force Navy to stop, start doing things that they don't want to, which is throw the ball, run reverses, a lot of misdirection. If they could have it their way, they're going to read the nose tackle, either hand it off to the fullback, scrape down the line, and pitch or keep. That's what they want to do all day long. And so if we can keep them uh, you know, with a, with a two-yard, three-yard gain average on first down, uh, I think that that will put us in great position to dominate them defensively. Awesome. All right, that was good. Uh, what's been going on at the Little Greek since we talked to you last? I think you opened a store, right? Yes, we did open our Windermere location, which for anybody listening on the on the podcast is uh, you know out there off five thirty five in West Side Shops in Windermere. It's uh, you almost need to live out there if you ever want to go because there's no quick way to get there. Um, but we got that open, great location for us. The the it has produced the way that we anticipated, and I know that community out there has certainly been receptive. Um, and now we kind of got a, a a month off for me specifically where I'm not out opening any stores and then starting December 10th, we will open our Lee Vista location, which for anybody listening is over there by Epic movie theaters, uh, near Lee Vista and the airport off of 436. We'll be opening a location there as well in the month of December. So we're very excited about that. Awesome. All right, Kyle. Well, thank you so much, man. It was really good to talk to you since it's been a while. I appreciate uh, you having me on. I'm glad uh, we got to do this and uh, look forward to a great homecoming week. All right, Night Nation, a win would move UCF to 9-0 and zero and would be the Knights' 22nd straight victory. A win would also be UCF's 13th straight at home with games against Cincinnati and the Cows closing out the regular season. Here's what you need to do before Saturday's noon kickoff in a game airing on ESPN2. Number one, listen to Nightline 169 as we recap UCF's win over Temple and continue to preview the 2018-19 men's basketball season. Plus, your football game prep continues with the latest episode of the Sons of UCF. And finally, Nightline Now recaps Tuesday night's men's basketball victory over Ryder. For Trace Trelko, I'm Andrew Fegley. Thanks for listening to Nightline Extra. Go Knights and charge on.